<laughs> the birds have been chirping all morning. It's been great. <laughs> So Jennifer, did the sculpture arrive yesterday? Yes. No, Monday. I'm sorry. Monday. My days are all running together. It's crazy. It was Monday. <laughs> yeah. It's just been an insane week already. Why? I know. It's hard to believe it's only Wednesday. <laughs> exactly. Looks like we might have a little intimate crowd today for today's book club, but that's okay. Yeah. Carol, did you have a chance to read it? I read it. I read it. I read it. <laughs> you did too, Ann? Yes, I did. I did. Good. So we can, like Cassandra said, have a good close discussion. Pardon? Like Cassandra said, we can have a good small discussion. Well, I won't have much to I won't have anything to say. A part of the book, as I went through, it was redundant. A lot of it was to me. So I sort of skipped a little bit along. But anyway, but I did complete it. Okay. Well, we hope you'll jump in when we get started. No, I don't. I read it so long ago. I've read it's been weeks since I read. I forgot about, <laughs> what book is it? <laughs> oh. Give it another minute or so and then we can get started. Alice? Yes. Alice. My granddaughter, Zoe Zink, I learned this week, has a piece of art in the new dis museum on display. I know. Brandy, can you show it on your phone? I can. Yeah, and I had just told Alice about that. Uh, and she had her, her first place is at the Armory uh, Museum, yeah, wherever they, they don't display it. She got first place for piece two, but it's at the museum, at the Armory. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Oh. Is the museum open for people to come in or not? Yes. I thought it was. I, I'll get. I'm gonna get out there this weekend to see her piece. I haven't seen it yet, so I just learned okay. Friday, well, Sunday, I guess. Pardon? Because if you come on a Wednesday, you can see me. I'm in the gatehouse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the only reason to come, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Then to see Zoe's artwork. I mean, really, you have a twofer. <laughs> <laughs> she started doing artwork when she was like in kindergarten. I've got pieces here in the house that she did. She just, but I haven't had any pieces in a long time. But anyway, but, and she won first place a few years ago too. And I have it on my cell phone and she sent me the picture of it. So, but anyway, so she enjoys it. She just does what she enjoys doing. And so, wonderful. Good morning, Randy. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Liz? Great. Fine. Are, are you upstairs? I am actually in the gatehouse. It's gatehouse Wednesdays for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's a song. I'm in the oh, gatehouse man. now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's 12.01. I think we can probably get started. And of course, if people um, join us after, we'll just let them in and catch them up. 
But um, thank you all for being here today for our art and letters. Um, Old in Art School, a memoir of starting over by Nell Painter. Um, we want to thank Gretchen Sipiel, did I say that right? Yeah, Gretchen, uh, for recommending this book to us for this year's read. Um, I think that it was really interesting um, to have a memoir and one that dealt with the issues in such a raw and authentic way, I think, um, as this book did. And so we want to just open up, uh, hi, Lisa. We want to just open up the discussion uh, today with what did you all think of the book? What were your overall impressions? Did you like the book? Oh, and before we do that, I should mention today, um, for I think everybody knows me, but my name is Cassandra Kavnis and um, I'm the development assistant. And I will be co hosting today with Alice Novak. We're going to kind of co host this one today. Um, Laura, who was originally scheduled to co host or to host this event, uh, she is at home spending time with her lovely newborn son um, and, you know, regrets that she cannot be here with us today, but, you know, silver lining, she gets to spend time with that wonderful new baby. So um, hopefully Alice and I can, can do this justice. But um, now we want to open it up for some discussion about what you guys thought overall. I thought it was a brilliant book. It was um, poignant. It um, was fluidly and brilliantly written. It addressed many different significant issues. Um, and at the same time, that are personal issues and cultural issues. And at the same time was very informative. And I learned a lot about um, uh, because she referenced so many artists that uh, impacted her uh, thinking. Uh, it gave me a lot of opportunity to open up and, and look at uh, the works of different artists that uh, I, uh, some of them I knew, some of them I didn't know. And uh, that was pretty wonderful. Any other thoughts? Well, I thought it was interesting that uh, she was on the Stephen Colbert show. <laughs> I, I, just, I thought, well, I missed that. <laughs> but um, I, I love the way she was so open about everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it really made you think yeah. about things. Yeah, she thanks Stephen Colbert in the credits. <laughs> Yeah. Very open indeed, too. Did you say raw, Cassandra? I did, yes. Very raw, very authentic. Oh. Other thoughts? So when Cassandra and I thought about this, we thought that we would look at four themes in the book that rose up for us of interest. And those are sort of her journey from being this world-class historian of such prominence that she has an IMDb record with her documentaries. And she's such a player in the historical field and traveling from that to graduate art student and seriously committing herself in a new career and also her, her work that emerged on that journey, her inspiration, her thoughts, and with this openness that Carol talked about, the insecurity she faced, the criticism she faced, which everyone in art school faces, right? But the play between the external critic and the internal critic and where she arrived along that journey, as well as, as Lisa said, all of these aspects of society that she encounters and culture that she encounters. Uh, Cassandra and I rattled off a, a string of isms, but ageism, sexism, 
racism, anti-intellectualism, you know, jump in. I'm sure I'm forgetting some elitism and how she observes all of these phenomena and navigates all these phenomena. And so Cassandra, thanks for having me. It's been a, a real joy to work with you on this and, and be part of this program. And, and I will note, um, there are a lot of parallels with all of our individual lives to this story, but Lisa, you're embarking on in, in reviving an, an art career um, at this time in your life as well. Uh, amongst all the ways we can relate to our author. So Cassandra, I'll hand it back to you to start that discussion. Hey, thank you, Alice. Yeah, so we kind of thought we would start um, in terms of her journey, right? So from where she was to where she's going. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that kind of struck me is that um, that first, very first chapter where they talk about um, you know, you're too old for this. You're starting over it at too late a point in your life, right? Um, for me, it struck me as, as so relatable because there are so many times in our lives when for whatever reason, personal ambition or, you know, you kind of just feel like you've learned everything you can in your current profession or gotten where you needed to go and you want to try something new or whatever, um, that you decide to embark on a new adventure. And there are people out there that say, no, you're too old. No, you're too this. No, you're too that. Um, but we have to kind of embrace the fact that this is what we want to do and we want to move forward. So I wanted to discuss that a little bit in terms of um, just like our own lives and our own relatability and how, how did hearing what she had to say and understanding what she was thinking in terms of that journey uh, resonate with all of us. So how did that resonate with you guys? I know how it did for me, but you know, I wanna leave room for discussion and leave the floor open. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, since I didn't read the book, I'm not going to be contributing. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, you know, it, it's funny just even listening to talk about this a little bit. And when I think about art and I think about artists coming to art and sort of reviving a career in art, I, I think in some ways it's the school part that was more probably of an issue, like going back to school and people thinking that that's a young person's thing, because I don't think of art as being limited by age by any means. And I think there are a lot of artists that start their careers later in life or turn to art later in life. And so, you know, again, didn't read the book, but I would almost think that her experience was really through that lens of going back to grad school and being surrounded by younger people, mm -hmm. you know, and people that, you know, kind of come into it, you know, straight from undergrad to grad school. And, you know, it, it's funny because I, I would think that somebody coming, at it later is gonna probably be more successful in their career in some ways. There's so many people that go to art school that come out of art school and don't ever end up being an artist because you know, they just don't have the life skills to deal with what being an artist really truly entails. But again, didn't read the book. So that could be way off. <laughs> no, very valid insights and very relevant to her story. Lisa, Lisa you're muted. muted. I think, Lisa, I think you're sharing something with us, but I think you're muted. I was just saying, Jennifer, if you have a chance, it is a brilliant book. It's so worth reading. It, it's, um, it's provocative. And I think that what you said about art school is true. Um, you know, it, it has to, with any career, when you go from being the top in your career to your, put yourself in a placement as the beginner and in a different field. You know, I think that one of the, the things she did not address 
which to me was often, I think, the elephant in the room. And maybe this has to do with her um, heightened sense of dignity. Um, and that is that I think that some of the people that were the teachers in art school were probably jealous of her life accomplishments because so many people in art school in, in the art world, you know, want to become uh, recognized as the top in their field. And they, they don't make that accomplishment. She was getting recognized by the highest nationally and internationally recognized institutions in the United States with honorary doctorates, with uh, different awards. And this was going on not only prior to her um, going to art school, but during the time that she was going to art school. And, you know, one of these times when she was getting, um, you know, an award at the top in her field for his, her historical writing and contributions, um, a teacher who was supposed to do a review of her work toward, um, you know, the, the, uh, the end of, uh, you know, looking at her perf final portfolio, uh, didn't even want to get back to her. You know, she was, seemed insulted that she took off to go get this um, highest award in a field and didn't make the time when uh, she was making herself available for doing these uh, reviews. Thought her not serious because she was interested in two fields. Yeah, I think that's a good point is, is this struggle that she kind of talks about throughout the book um, with her academic side and her artist side, right? And, you know, she talks about how her academic side sometimes misleads or misled her artist side. And when she would, you know, come at it from an academic standpoint, she feared that her work would then be called academic or boring or, you know, unoriginal, that type of thing, instead of what she wanted it to be, which was creative and innovative and all these other things. And so I think that constant push and pull struggle um, between these two fields um, was definitely an issue for her. But I personally, you know, I feel like it helped her, you know, it helped her to be able to tap into things that other people weren't able to tap into or notice things that other people weren't able to tap into because she had all this life experience and all of these um, wonderful uh, accolades behind her, right? And so I think that really played as, as a type of advantage, I would say. Yeah, and once she was free of art school, she went and started using her words and her images together. Once she was past the constraint of um, art teachers saying that was passe or that she didn't do it well, you know, once she, she was her own critic, she, um, and not, uh, not so focused on pleasing those select few people that she had as teachers, um, she excelled in embracing the two things that she's good, in, good at. Yeah, that, that's very true. And I think that's a good segue to talk about um, her art along the way. Absolutely. So uh, for those of you who haven't read the book, she had studied art as an undergrad at Berkeley before this illustrious career in history. And her mother had also gone back later in life as a writer. Um, so when she's returning to graduate school, you know, Cassandra and I were talking earlier about how free she felt in making. And then all of a sudden she encounters these struggles. She's the famous historian going to the writing center to get feedback about writing about her art. And, and, and as you all said, bringing in this life experience um, and, caring for parents and doing things that, you know, running historical organizations and that her peers were not. So leaping in with her art itself, what she creates in this time, what struck you 
about the art that she created. What did you think were the things on her mind that inspired her, the conflicts that she was trying to resolve that she expressed? Tell us a little bit about your perspective on her art. you like any particular period of her work, relate to it? You know, Lisa's already jumped in with the idea that she's combining word and image, that this is really something that makes her seem sort of to fit nowhere and that isn't embraced always by her instructors, but she uses text even in the very book we read um, the work that is is pictured on the cover um what else about her art what else did you notice what else resonated besides her love of image and word which of course goes well with our group i, I feel like i keep hey talking somebody else please no you want me to talk? I think if you talk, you might inspire somebody else to talk. Okay, if you feel so inspired, go for it. <laughs> you know, I think that one of the things that was really dynamic was that sense of using art to mirror and bring forward, um, not only with culture, but with all those images that she did, self those self portraits that she did. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, realizing uh, it, it really pushed her to realize as, uh, you know, became really a, a major part of the cultural conversation in the 1960s through the 1970s and onward that, you know, there really aren't um, images of, of women and there aren't images of women in color in museums and that, the long trajectory through history was to study how to do art by studying the master's work. And there weren't masters and there weren't many other celebrated artists um, depicting um, uh, skin color variation and, um, and, and age and um, women uh, um, defining themselves through their art and, and being celebrated in museums. And in doing so, she did a, an intent, she went down a, this tunnel of um, doing self-portraits of herself as an older black woman. And uh, she used different uh, materials that echoed elements of herself in different ones. And so they each had, um, uh, reflections of, of different aspects of her. Uh, she wasn't so concerned that they were exacting, um, mm -hmm. but that they, but that they conveyed um, the beauty of um, uh, of age of a woman of a woman um, of scholarship of a woman uh, from, that came from a society, and um, she really. Um, felt that she needed to create that because she didn't have mentors to do that from. So two characteristics that you've described, both the love of language and image, but also the love of identity of the person, mm -hmm. of self, of figure and representing these concepts, which again, were the same concepts. In some ways she'd been studying as a historian, but another place she was not embraced necessarily and um, didn't get great feedback for, but it's her passion, it's her calling. And when you're talking about aspects of especially older women and representation, she, she talks about so many artists and, there, and there's so many examinations of different women artists, different artists of color, but really the exploration of Alice Neal's self-portrait struck me 
it has been shown at this museum some time ago. It's in the National Portrait Gallery, but the particular self-portrait she's talking about was as a nude elderly woman. Woman. Yeah, older woman and as a painter. And I've always personally loved that work. And, and she speaks to this inspiration then, as you say, represents herself, but somewhat conceptually, Donna, did you have something to add? Um, am I muted? I don't we know. can hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, I just, I loved it. Uh, I love the way she talked about Alice Neal and Carol Walker, uh, Carol Walker's work. And, uh, you know, I, um, Carol Walker's father was head of the art department when I went back to school. And um, I can remember hearing about Carol Walker and at first seeing her things and it was just so new and different, you know? And I do think, didn't she talk about in the book that she even tried some cutting out like that, some silhouettes yeah. and, um, yeah. you know, the way she brought up these different artists and some of them I'd never heard of. So, you know, it makes me, I haven't looked them up yet, but I thought this is a great resource also of just looking up the artist's work that she talks about, um, you know, but uh, no, I thought the book was, I mean, I haven't finished it yet. I'm halfway through, but, um, but I think it's a wonderful book. It just is a great resource. So. And you brought up such an important point that her study, she's very committed to copying artists that she yeah. loves and as you said she had several examples in the book mentions several examples in the book this is back to the sort of traditional training um, that we've referenced but she was very interested in studying and doing studies after other artists she has all of these real theoretical conversations going um, is art a commodity is art an idea She's very interested in these ideas of beauty and enslavement and, and the Odalisque. But did you feel that came out in her work? These questions about beauty and enslavement? Donna, you're saying not really? I don't think so. Well, I mean, I guess maybe later in the book, but the ones I've seen so far, uh, you know, just looked like she really was experimenting with a lot of different mm -hmm. techniques, which is great. And and she is, and she has, you know, I think some of her intellectual pursuits really do show up and others, you know, she's, she's getting out a um, book about um, the Mende and, and recreating images from that and others, there are these things she's interested in that she's just sort of exploring and enjoying philosophizing with people about did, other things that sort of occurred again and again in her art or her technique strike any of you? The thing that I that, that I liked was actually um, the manhole cover uh, piece that she did in school and I liked that it wasn't seen as like you know this this is artwork right that's not how they how our teachers viewed it but there were so many nuanced um meanings behind a manhole cover right so i have so i have a friend who's an ethno uh oh what's her ethno musicologist i think is her title but basically what she does is she studies um the sound and how does that change as gentrification happens and so she does a lot of sound studies in different types of environments, um, urban environments um, with predominantly black neighborhoods as they're being gentrified. And that particular piece struck me as that type of um, intellectual pursuit, right? So what does a manhole cover mean? Who would use a manhole cover? Why are manhole covers necessary? Like who who would have crafted the manhole cover and why are they in that particular profession in this city, right? And so there's all these questions that you can kind of dig at with just a simple manhole cover that I felt like, you know, her her professors didn't appreciate at the time. And they it kind just of said, looked like right. 
I sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but they kind of said, been there, done that, come up with something else, right? Yeah. And why doesn't it have value anymore? That's what she sees as value. Well, I admire her ability to experiment so much, you know, I think, I think her creativity was in her experimenting and um, I don't know what her later pieces, as I say, I haven't finished. So I was looking back here to see, but she really tried a lot of things, a lot of techniques. And, uh, you know, for so many people, that's certainly hard to do. Um, Absolutely. And she does have these series that come out, especially when she's grad in graduate school, you know, sitting at her ailing father's bedside or, or looking at what she calls the unfashioned series and looking at some uh, travel clothing and traditional clothing. And as she works by the lake in the summer, and, and again, as Donna said, experimenting series upon series and really brave. And I, I thought it was very interesting to see those drawings early in her life from Ghana, you know, all the way to her thesis and beyond and her residencies. Um, but one thing that, as we think about relation to past and present and tradition and innovation, you know, she was being very 21st century in her technique. You know, even if everyone kept telling her that she was limited and yeah. of another time and she felt that way, you know, she did digitally manipulate her own work and integrate it into her work and experiment with that. Carol, that sort of resonated with you. You're still muted. And I think you're saying yes. Or what are you saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and Cassandra described that earlier as even something that was discarded or as a mistake that she cast aside in another work, show back up and be yeah. reintegrated and, and this giving something new life. And so all of that um, really kind of informed and in, informs, I suppose, her practice. We really don't know what she's working on right now. Reddit, that's all a little um, documentary that PBS had done on her, but I don't know currently what she's up to. Um, but so shifting gears to sort of that next topic of insecurity and criticism and how we internalize criticism. Uh, what did you guys think about that? I, I thought it was kind of sad, you know, cause she was so brilliant. I mean, extraordinarily brilliant. And she brought so much to the table. And yet, you know, she kind of beat herself up for life's distractions. You know, when her mother got sick, when her father got sick, when her cousin got sick, and she would stop and go, look, you know, that's, that's humanity. All of us do that. But and, and she did it with a whole heart, but she also did it with such a strong sense of um, having failed, not done a hundred images during the course of the summer, but only done 67. And, and you know, I, I got the book in um, the paperback, but I also got the audio book. And then the audio book, it's her voice. Oh. And it's really extraordinary. And you could hear her tone where she's saying 67 with a tone of disgust, you know, that she didn't, she didn't do the hundred. She thought she would, she would surpass, you know, a hundred was no big deal. She could do 200 and all she did was 67. So she was um, a harsh critic on herself. Um, and maybe that's why she was so successful. Um, you know, she, she kind of, was a bit of a critic on herself because she wasn't part of what America saw as the, the block or the norm of perception of black America. You know, she came from a academic, um, uh, accomplished middle-class family. And she felt like she needed to, um, 
feel bad about that a little bit because, you know, it, it, she didn't pull herself up from the bottom. She pulled herself up from a family that gave her so much support and opportunity. And, um, you know, there were many ways. And when people would critique her work, she took it very personally. And, you know, and then would look around and, and uh, question their, their motive, not their being a good person or a bad person per se, but their motive in terms of, you know, who determines what's art? Mm -hmm. Who determines what's good art? Who determines that something is illustration, something that's bad? Or commercial, something that's bad and real art? And what is the difference between being an artist and being a real artist? You know, all of these, all of these criticisms that came her way, she would, she wouldn't um, uh, just take a face value. She would, because of her brilliance, she would open them up like a fan and look at all the different factors that felt fed into perception. In, in a way that uh, was very articulate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she does sort of bring up this idea we mentioned of any kind of art school being a process of being torn down, <laughs> that the critique is such an essential part, but at the same time when her professor is saying, you can't draw, you can't paint, yeah. as Lisa said, she takes these things so much to heart, but it, also says, was everybody hearing this? And she isn't quite sure what, what others are getting. Um, and it is sad. I agree, Lisa, that she feels so emotionally reduced, but very real to experience in ways that I'm sure all of us can relate to. And, and you know, she's dissed for that manhole cover that Cassandra loved or the representation that Donna talked about um, and, and really feels hated, feels alone um, and feels animosity and, and response. What did y'all think about the voice she wrote in as it relates to sort of perception of self, perception of others? How would you describe just the, the tone of this memoir? I think it's a great art history lesson too, <laughs> I guess. You know, that's what I was amazed at is that she keeps making references to different movements in art history uh, that I found really intriguing. And some of her comments, you know, that you know, uh, you know, about Warhol and how commercial his was mm -hmm. and taking other people's work and using it and, you know, um, I don't know. I just I love some of the, the of her reflections on that too. I'm very honest about, you know, is this art? I mean, can you take somebody else's and incorporate it in your work? And is that original? Is that, you know, how do you make it original? And um, anyway, I just it's so much a commentary on all different levels, really, seems to me, not just her own personal work but about the art world in general. Um, so there's this complexity of, of thinking about the art world, thinking about her role in it, as Lisa said, taking in information, filtering it. Um, and she, I, you know, I think the voice is pretty raw again. Mm. I mean, did the cuss words throw you off? No. It, it, it seemed like she was having fun just being able to be herself and yeah. not have to be her academic self, but her self-self. Um, she definitely threw in a few. Um, other ideas about navigating the self-doubt and insecurity she felt. I just, I wanted to step back a second and talk about the tone of the book in terms of that you were just asking, it, it was very, uh, it, I felt like, and again, because in part I listened to it, a book on tape, mm -hmm. but it felt like sitting down with a friend 
telling you the, that you haven't seen for a few years right. and hearing the story of what her experience was and her going off on tangents of musing about, you know, what, what with, with intellectual, um, poetic, um, fl fluid, uh, word choice and organization of words uh, in a way that, you know, where you just have to like look at a person and say, my goodness, you are, you know, you're extraordinary. And to put yourself through that, she gave up living in the comfort of the community that she, she loved. She gave up living with her husband to go a far distance to live independently. She threw herself from being in the top of the game to being surrounded by kids and being an insider and an outsider simultaneously, where she could have stayed in that bubble of accolade. You know, she's a brave woman. And, um, and at the same time, she's a woman who um, has deep questions of herself, deep questions of history. And, um, and is uh, a, an incredible hard worker and um, puzzle worker. You know, when she was presented with challenges, she she kept pushing. Even when you know, the, as I mentioned before, the professor was pissed that she wasn't going to be available for final poly, um, portfolio review offering to, to go to a different state to, to show it. Or, um, you know, um, figuring out ways to, to make experiences still uh, push her herself and her work forward. You know, when she would go visiting places, she would continue to do problem solving with art. I thought it was quite brilliant. And she also relates to kind of Alice Neal's self-doubt and Alice Neal's feeling that she has a retrospective at the Whitney and finally she feels that she's taken seriously and that was very real. It was still very hard for a woman today to make art. Um, and be taken as seriously as men and, and and really does get to that conclusion. Sorry to spoil the end, Donna, when you're not finished. Of, um, not letting outsiders define us and really define, defining ourselves. So of all the ways we can be defined externally, um, in some ways, I, I really feel like the questions of prejudice were, were at the heart of this book. And Cassandra, take us home with that topic. Yeah, I think that this book really kind of delved into a lot of different areas in terms of prejudice. So, you know, we had elitism, ageism, anti-intellectualism, racism, um, you know, just to name a few. And, um, you know, I felt like all the ways in which she encountered this um, the, these obstacles on the outside, she also struggled with internally, right? So she talked about how she had been comfortable being viewed in a certain way. She had been comfortable being ignored because she was a person of color or ignored because of this or that. But then when she got to art school and now it's her identity was that she was old, right? Um, and she had to come to grips and come to terms with the fact that now she's the old black lady, she's not the the she's not just the black lady, or she's not just a lady, or just a black person. She's old, and I, what I found interesting was that the ageism kind of went both ways. So she was being, um, you know, experiencing it from her point of view in terms of you know people looking at her and saying you're too old and this and that, this and that, but then you're kind of in her mind and understanding that she's looking at these people as like these little teeny boppers and, you know, through her, her um, perspective that 
it kind of went both ways. And so for me, I think we need to talk about a little bit what role do all of these isms, right, that we encounter in life play? How did they shape us? How did they shape her work? And if she had not had these isms to deal with on the outside, what might her work have looked like at the end of her career? For me, I think that, you know, if she hadn't been experiencing all of these outside forces, um, I don't think it would have pushed her in such a direction, right? Because she was used to being good at things. Everything kind of came naturally, it came easy to her, right? She was used to being able to write papers well. She was used to be able to doing research well. And when she switched careers and she started doing art, you know, full time, she found that that wasn't the case. People were telling her no. People were telling it's not good enough. People were saying you need to practice more, this and that. And so all of those, those comments, though, were a little bit of anti-intellectualism or a little bit of sexism or a little bit of racism or a little bit of this sprinkled into those comments. And so how how can we imagine what her, what her work, end work and what her work today might look like if she hadn't experienced that. Like, you know, she went back to look at Kara, Kara Walker's um, work and understand that she not only drew these kind of in your face, or she not only created kind of in your face images and, and work, but that there was real skill, real technique, real intellectualism behind the work, right? And so that's kind of what drew her to Ale or to, um, Kara Walker. If she hadn't been facing those type of things, would she have been drawn to her? Would she have studied her as closely as she did? We, we don't know, but she might not have, right? So that might have influenced the way in which her work kind of flowed from there. Thoughts? I, I agree with you. I also agree with you because she was a historian that she was looking at the broad scope of influence. And, um, um, and, you know, all of that informed her work. One of the things that Alice had mentioned earlier was that, you know, Alice Neal didn't feel that she had made it until she got a retrospect in the Whitney. But who gives Whitney that, the Whitney that power, right? Where, where does that come from? Does it still exist today? Remember, this book was written in 2018. And she was back in undergrad in what, 2008. It's not that long ago. It's not even 20 years ago that these thoughts and musings are occurring to Nell Painter. So who gives that authority? And has that changed? And not just at the Whitney, but in any museum. You know, who, who allows you to become a major artist and, and why? Let's talk about that for a minute. I think there's still such huge discrimination in the collections of museums. Uh, I mean, I saw something recently on that, you know, and there's, it's mostly still white men, you know, in the collection. And uh, I mean, I know when I was in art school, our art history book didn't have one single woman in it, not one, you know, and uh, it, it just was amazing to me that even when I brought it up, um, you know, I was told, well, those weren't very good artists. Yeah. You know, like Judy Chicago, for God's sake, or, you know, just a whole group of people and, and uh, were just are still dismissed. Um, and particularly, I think, um, artist of color, you know, not just women, but I think artist of color. Well, and one of the things that she talked about was that a large part of who makes the decisions are the wealthy patrons and the yeah. wealthy patrons 
are these um, people who in many ways live outside of the norm of society because of their great wealth. And then to, she was referring to, to, to support their ego, they then make donations in their name to, uh, to institutions that collect art. And that um, for a long time, you know, it was really a, an all boys society. And um, she was very aware of that. I mean, just look at the way self-taught artists, the perception of them has changed, you know, in, in over the years, the acceptance of people who've taught themselves, uh, who haven't had official Well, training. she talked about that too. And she talked about the difference between value that United States museums and collectors put on self-taught artists versus what Europe was putting on American self-taught artists, that there was a schism and uh, that it was uh, moving in a direction toward equalizing, but that the schism had been pretty dramatic for a long time. Yeah. I'm gonna jump in, um, Cassandra, you were asking like, is it the Whitney or New York museums or who are sort of the, the authority and who's granted them that authority? And while I think, yes, there are certain museums that are still considered maybe like the pinnacle, if you have a show at MoMA, if you have a show at the Whitney, you've kind of made it. But what I do think that has been changing over the last couple of years, the last probably couple decades now is that that authority has been slowly moving outside of the museum sphere and more into the art market so that you have like Lisa saying collectors um, who are controlling sort of the reputations of these artists because it's the the galleries the collectors auctions that are generating excitement and recognition of artists that may not have come through the traditional museum system as they might have in the past. Yeah. You know, now you have collectors swooping in at art schools saying, who are the hot artists that I, we want to support and we'll buy their body of work. And it, it has kind of changed the natural progression of it. maybe it's not so natural, but what it was in the past at any rate. Well, dialing it down to the um, micro a little bit, were there any particular experiences of prejudice that she faced that made an impression on you or struck you? Uh, a little more kind of the global impact. I mean, I, I think for me, it was just so simple, but and Cassandra's already kind of brought up the how old are you at Rutgers, but at RISD, the when she went to the print room that day, printmaking studio, and the person at the door said, why are you here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just what kind of possible assumption is that loaded with I mean there were, there were so many examples she gave and sometimes just a lack of interest lack of response lack of interest in reading certain feminist yeah. theorists of color um but even the prejudice as a caregiver or not prejudice but just challenge and difference I mean, Donna when you were in art school you were a caregiver of children weren't you oh yeah in fact uh, when I went back to school, I was afraid I couldn't even find a parking place or drive down to town, Atlanta. You know, I thought, I'm not even sure I'm capable of doing this because I've been taking kids around and hadn't even been downtown. I hadn't dealt with that, you know, and it was very fearful, truthfully, going back. But thankfully, there were a number of older students um, in the master's program there, which was good. Um, you know, but um, that made it a little easier, but yeah, very intimidating. 
And um, I'll never forget, I had a painting teacher. I went into painting first for three years before I, I had to drop out because of family concerns. And I, I went back two years later and the, my painting professor had told me he was criticizing that I kept putting paintings together. And he said, you know, you really should go into sculpture. And I thought, I took that to mean you suck at painting. <laughs> so forget painting because you just can't do it, you know, which in retrospect, after two years of being at home then after that and then going back, I went into sculpture and it was true. That was exactly what I needed to do. So, you know, it's uh, sometimes the criticism is something you need to hear and take it in and uh, let it kind of gel for a while. And, you know, but it, it does, it stings. <laughs> the, the criticism you get in art school is not easy to take. Um, that's so. very well said, that it can both sting and be a sort of point of return and transformation. Yeah, and I mean, I, I can't believe how many nights I would sit up most of the night and then have to get up and take the kids places, you know. I mean, because in art school, you don't know how long it's going to take you to finish a project. I mean, you can't say, okay, I'm going to work on this for an hour and then I'm done. You may be working on it for days to get it completed so you know to, to balance children and family and go to school I mean this woman was you know uh, especially the older you are I guess unless you just don't have children then that's that makes it easier <laughs> I guess. but then you've got parents right yeah then you have parents or some other things to deal with yeah yeah definitely so it is it's a challenge sorry Cassandra didn't mean to jump oh, in no. here no, you're fine. Another, I was going to say another point you were asking about specifics when she was sitting on the floor at the very beginning and she had the agility to pop up, you know, uh, with the younger people as quickly. But she felt that her she was immediately judged because of her age, not because of her physical ability, but because of, um, the you know, what's perceived about age. And the other thing, that she also talked about was prejudice against body weight mm -hmm. and um and you know the the sense of the uh, you have more you're you're smarter if you're thinner you're more capable if you're thinner you're more successful if you're thinner and she felt that um she had one of her parents inclination toward being heavier, I don't remember which one anymore. And she felt that she was being judged because she um, uh, she wasn't thin like, and she and she didn't costume herself. Also, which was another thing about how you dress, whether you dress in a way that um, the, uh, the the current eccentric norm in art school, or whether you dress differently. You know, these were some of the other smaller um, ways, but that still impacted her, her psyche um, of how you were valued and whether you were perceived as being a real artist. An artist artist was the term she used. Yeah, that's a good point, Lisa. She talked, I think she talked about a little bit about her body issues um, and not wanting to be fat. Um, because her mother would say, you know, you don't want to look like um, a fat black woman, because then that is going to be a stereotype people are going to have in your head, in their head, about you being a house person, a nanny, a, a lower level, non intellectual um, being, right. And I think that that that's really an interesting comparison um, between how one may be perceived by looking a certain way versus you know what one actually is and I felt like that's really what this book was about in essence is like identity right and how do we identify self-identify but then how do people around us identify us by the way we look by the way we talk by the by the work we produce right and so how do we balance those two sometimes and often 
very dramatic differences but between the way we see ourselves and the way the world sees ourselves and I think that was one of the the themes that kind of carried through this book um I think that this book if you have not read it is worth the read um worth the time to read it and it goes rather quickly because you know, it is a memoir, so there's not, you know, a ton of technical jargon or things like that that bog you down. Um, and it's um, so, as we have said, so authentic that it, it, it reads quickly and it's very um, heartful. Al Alice and I had a conversation this morning about this book and, you know, Alice had said at the end of the book, I felt like I had a friend, like I knew her. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, th I think that that's, you know, the token of a good memoir is, is being able to have that feeling at the end of the book. So for all of you who have not, um, finished or have not started, I encourage you to do so. Um, it is a wonderful read. And we just thank you so much for being here today with us to discuss the book and to talk about these, these issues in and out of the art world and how they um, help or hinder um, us in everyday lives. So thank you, Alice, for joining, us to, joining me today to co-host this event. Um, thank you all for being here at this event. And we cannot wait until the next one. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. So Lisa, Thank it you very much. when you said that um, she felt like a friend to you too. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. You know, I'd it, love to meet her. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wouldn't that, Wouldn't that be fabulous if we yeah. could bring her into? Yeah. <laughs> or we could get a new work where she feels like she fits in and she's in her. There you go. Zone. I want to say if you have the opportunity to listen to the um uh the the audio book of it and at the same time have your computer or ipad available because as she she references all these other artists um i felt that the book really was enhanced by being able to look up their works and and uh, reference some of the images particular images that she was talking about and a uh, style of art that she was referencing, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point, Lisa, because as both you and Donna have said that this book is really more of a resource, right? There's so many rich um, details in here um, and tidbits of artists and people that are really important to the field, but also just important to understand her. And um, if you do get a chance to you know, just browse Google a little bit um, about these these artists and these images that she talks about. I really do think and agree with Lisa that it does enhance your understanding um, and appreciation for the book and her as an artist. And her sort of view of how, of the burden artists of color have upon them to kind of yeah. speak of communally, historically, um, some of the themes that came up in the exhibition Ancestry and Innovation that Jennifer and Cassandra both worked on. Um, very interesting perspective and in how others have addressed that. And, and back to what everybody said about Kara Walker and people feeling very strongly about images of degradation and violence being so popular, but how fascinating that Kara Walker went to Newark to kind of stand up for her work when it was being questioned in the public sphere and in the library and, and won everybody over. Just so many interesting uh, aspects of that kind of wellspring of, of resource of ideas and the way she's spun the art world around. And I would also encourage you too, to read this through um, the lens of what we've learned about Bethany Collins, who's currently up in our, our galleries. Um, one of the things Bethany talked about was um, physical labor and the physical exhaustion of her work. And that's also something that um, Nell talks about is the, the act of physically making something 
um, working through that grief or that pain or that uh, that feeling really was helpful to her and allowed her to 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 free herself from some of the constraints. And I feel like Bethany kind of does the same thing. Like she works through her um, her questionings and her musings through this very physical act of creating. And so, um, you know, if you get a chance to read this um, before it, our show goes down on May 9th, I encourage you to then come back to the museum and look at some of Bethany Collins' work through that lens. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And Thank you all. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.